Welcome to science class. Today we begin a brand new course studying the natural world. This time it's biology. Biology, if you didn't know, is the study of life. All life. Every species, every interaction, every environment, and at every level of the living organism, from its own internal chemistry down to the molecular level, all the way up to the individual organism and how that individual, or an entire population of that individual, impacts its immediate environment or even the planet. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, living things are complicated. To be frank, biology is almost too general of a term. If you talk to a professional biologist and ask them, so do you study all life? They'll say, no, I only study a few particular species, or their area of emphasis will be the environment and how it impacts species. We will hit a lot of different subject areas throughout this course. Sadly, we won't be able to do most of these subject areas justice. That would just take way too much time. Take a single chapter in a biology textbook on, say, evolution. You could enroll for an entire semester in college on that one chapter, or have your entire major and career focus on that. Our goal here is not to make you an expert in one area. I want to expose you to all the ways in which biology impacts your life. And there are quite a lot of them. So with that being said, let's get started. For my money, biology is the most important human study. Now, I just got done ranting about how biology isn't even a single thing. It's all kinds of things rolled into one. Yeah, okay, I get it. Maybe that answer is cheating. But really, if humanity had to theoretically start over on this planet or another planet, what would be the most important knowledge we could take with? Math? That's not going to put food into people's mouths. It has to be biology. I mean, you are a living thing for crying out loud. Technology can be applied in countless ways to make our lives better. But if we're talking about improving the well-being of people, who after all are animals, then you can see that studying life is the most direct route to maximizing our own benefits. For this introduction video, we're going to start with the absolute basics, the essentials of living things. What qualifies something as alive? Life is weird. Like, I'm definitely alive. That's pretty obvious. But a rock, that's definitely not alive. A tree is most certainly alive. A unicellular bacterium, that thing is totally alive. A river, not alive at all. But what about a virus? Is that alive? Viruses are complex. They have DNA or RNA. They multiply, they evolve. They have a definite structure and function to them. They interact with living things, but no, they're not alive. Which is weird because a virus isn't merely a chemical. It's way more complicated than that. How about a seed? Seeds don't do anything at all until they are triggered to. So does life spring from a seed or is the seed alive? These gray areas are fun to think about, but let's get down to the details. There are eight specific criteria that qualify something as alive that we will learn about today. Arguably, the most important characteristic is the cell. All living things are composed of one or more cells. A cell can be described as a collection of living matter enclosed in a barrier which separates it from its surroundings. As any chemist would gleefully tell you, and I tend to agree, life is just a series of chemical reactions. Those chemical reactions happen to take place inside of cells. That may sound reductionist, but it's absolutely true. Every single thing that you do is a result of a chemical reaction. For example, we can watch your most complex thoughts light up on a brain scanner. Those thoughts don't arise from some unknown mysterious force. It's billions of neurons working together. And those thoughts aren't even necessarily yours. We know through studying the gut bacteria, cells that are not human cells but are inside your body, that those bacteria thrive off of junk food and can chemically signal to your brain a craving for sugary foods. Makes you wonder who, or what, is really in charge. Back to the cell. I want you to keep this in mind as we go forward. Everything you do, your cells also do. The characteristics of living things we will cover in this video, your individual cells do all of them, or your doing of them arises from your cells. In fact, throughout much of this course, we will be studying events going on at the cellular level, because that's where activity is most crucial. Now in your body, you have specialized cells. Metazoans is a term that means animals. Specifically, humans are eumetazoans, or true animals. And even more specifically, we are tripoblastic, meaning we form embryologically from three different, what are called germ layers. 
This is what makes our internal anatomy complex with all kinds of tissue, muscle tissue, fat tissue, connective tissue, blood, nervous tissue, and more. So under the microscope, all of our cells in these different areas look different. Simpler animals like jellyfishes and anemones are dipoblastic. They arise from just two germ layers. The prophyria or sponges are the simplest of all animals. Their bodies form from just one germ layer. If you shred a sea sponge by pushing its body through a screen, those cells will colonize again into a new sponge. They can do that because they are simple enough to. Unicellular organisms, which by far dominate life on planet Earth, don't specialize. They can't, they're just one cell. That one cell has to be able to carry out all of the functions to maintain life, which being a single cell makes that a fairly manageable task. The biggest thing that works against unicellular organisms is that they can't adjust to their environment in real time quite like larger organisms can. Next comes reproduction. All organisms produce new organisms through some kind of reproduction. But reproduction is so complicated. In general, there are two kinds of reproduction. Sexual reproduction involves the fusion of two sets of DNA from two separate cells into the first cell of a new organism. Asexual reproduction occurs when a single parent produces an offspring that is usually genetically identical to it. There are two forms of asexual reproduction. Individual cells carry out binary fission. This is how bacteria multiply, but it's also how you and I and every organism grows. You started off as one cell. That cell made a copy of itself, and so on and so forth, and here you are. The fusion of two cells only occurs once in your life. Also, each individual cell in your body is a living thing. They all meet the criteria for life individually, and if we took any cell from your body and maintained the right conditions for it, it would continue living and growing and dividing without you. So would that cluster of cells in a petri dish be you? Would there be two of you? Or does it need consciousness to be you? And what is that? Sorry, this is just too much fun. The other kind of asexual reproduction is budding. Some animals do this. A piece of the animal's body pinches off and an entire organism grows from it. That organism will be almost genetically identical to its parent. But the lines of all this get blurred. Some complex animals are capable of parthenogenesis, reproduction without sex. Whiptail lizards can give birth to offspring without ever having sex. Drone bees are born from eggs that were never fertilized by sperm. So drone bees only have half the DNA that the queen does. As people, we obsessively categorize things. No, there can only be one kind of this or two kinds of that. Well, science tells us that things don't always fit nicely into imaginary boxes. Instead of resisting that knowledge, I say we embrace it. Next up, living things are based on a universal genetic code. That is to say, every living organism has DNA inside of almost all of its cells. DNA contains the information to build proteins, which allows cells to function. All life on the planet uses the same DNA blueprint. Four nucleotide base pairs, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Another nucleotide, uracil, is part of the protein synthesis process and makes up RNA, the sister molecule of DNA, but we won't worry about that for now. The universality of DNA is striking. More so than anything, it shows us how all life on Earth is interconnected through evolution. Humans, dogs, tulips, bacteria, were not made separately for their own purposes. We are all derived from common beginnings, and that can be traced through our DNA. The fourth characteristic of living things is that they grow and develop. Unicellular organisms develop by growing slightly larger, not much of a transformation. For multicellular organisms, growth and development refers mainly to differentiation, which is the process of cell specialization as we go from one cell to many. For the record, I'm going to be extremely biased towards animals in this biology class because I'm not much of an expert in plants, but also because animals are much more familiar to all of us. In animals, the most crucial stage of specialization occurs during embryonic development. When you are born, every kind of tissue and organ is in place. But many animals do undergo radical transformations after their embryological phase, such as the metamorphosis of a caterpillar or a tadpole. Now, none of this would be possible without raw materials and energy. Living things require a constant supply of oxygen, water, and nutrients. What we do with those raw materials is we break them down, then build them into living tissue. We call that metabolism, the collection of chemical reactions that maintain life. Think about this. If you have a dog, and that dog eats the same dog food its whole life. What that means is your dog is made out of that specific dog food and water, and that's it. 
Think of nutrients like Lego bricks. I could disassemble a Lego boat and build a Lego house out of it, no problem. Raw materials can be used to make anything, and our bodies do that with the molecules of our food. Some organisms have highly different metabolisms. The archaea, sometimes called extremophiles, are unicellular organisms. They're not bacteria, but like bacteria, they are prokaryotes, and they live in acid pools, boiling water, deep within mud volcanoes on the bottom of the ocean, and many other crazy places. They derive energy and get nutrients from completely inorganic sources like sulfur compounds. But they are the exception, not the rule. The vast majority of all living things get their nutrients and energy from organic sources, especially carbohydrates. Next up, living things respond to their environment. A response can be just about anything. Honestly, anything that a living organism does is basically a response to the environment. The signal which triggers a response is called a stimulus. Even unicellular organisms can have extremely dramatic responses to their environment. There's a unicellular type of amoeba that will form a supercluster of thousands of individuals when food runs low, and then it patrols around as if it is multicellular. Then it flattens out, releases spores, which is its way of reproducing, dies, and new individuals start the life cycle all over again. The way organisms respond to their environment is another kind of specialization. We say that organisms have adaptations to allow them to survive. This is what the phrase, survival of the fittest, which Darwin never really said, means. How well an organism fits into its environment. Adapting to the environment is an organism's way of maintaining a stable internal environment. The next characteristic of living things. Remember, the cell is separate from its surroundings. Homeostasis is a term that means to maintain a stable internal environment. Internal, as well as external stimuli, help organisms maintain stability. The feeling of hunger or thirst, the way plants curve their stem or trunk to remain upright, that crazy thing the amoeba does, all of these are in an effort to maintain conditions inside the cell. Your individual cells trigger your body to meet their needs through intercellular communication, usually through hormones. Finally, living things evolve. The concept of species is not rigid, it changes over time. We will have an entire video series devoted to evolution, but the most basic understanding of it is that the organisms you see today evolved from different species over millions upon millions of years. These gradual changes are what lead to the rich diversity of life on the planet. But most of that life has gone extinct. For every one of the millions of different species that are alive today, perhaps as many as a thousand have gone extinct in the distant past. Conditions on our planet change, sometimes dramatically. Only some organisms survive through changes, and their descendants branch out and diversify. Okay, so there is our introduction. Not so bad. Next time, we are going to take a look at what living things are made of. What atoms and molecules make up a living thing. Should be fun. Thanks for watching.